Commander Kern was barely a year old when Worf left for the Kittimer outpost. Kalest resides in the old quarter of the first city. And Captain Picard gives the very first F around and find out, Star Trek yeah. style. Hello, everybody, and welcome <laughs> to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation. You may have heard of it. Season 3, Episode 17, Sins of the Father, written by Ronald D. Moore and W. Reed Moran, directed by Sirach's buddy, Mr. Les Landau. We want to give a very mm -hmm. special thanks to Dr. Brenda Custodio for sponsoring this episode. Thank you very much, Dr. Brenda Custodio. You are awesome. This was... Brenda. March 17th, 1990. Can you believe it? It's episode 317, which aired on the date 317. What luck. How are you today, Sirach? Oh, yeah. How about that? Yeah. <clears throat> the Yeah, the numerology is great. Uh, I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm doing good. So, first things first, I definitely thought of you often. Ryan thought of Ciroc when <laughs> Kern showed up. Did you recognize your old self, old Jake Sisko? Yeah, not right away. Not right away. It took me a second. I was at first. I'm like, I know this actor. He's really tall. Uh, he was more lean at that time, you know, just slimmer. Very, and he looked so much younger. He did. He did. So it was a little bit. Difficult for me to recognize. In the beginning, I have to admit, I thought it was an actor named Leon, who's a pretty famous actor in the in the black movie world. And Leon was not Leon in Lett, above, right? No, Leon was in Above the Rim. He was in the Five Heartbeats. He, he, he's one of the great. He had a great run at, at a certain point in time. As one of the great black actors in in the business, and um, I was a big fan of his. So at first, I thought it was Leon, and as I was watching, I started to look at the faces. That's not quite Leon, you know. There's there's some aspects there, but it wasn't him. And that's when I really looked in. I said, "Is that Tony Todd? <laughs> the Tony Todd?" So yeah, that was a that was a pleasant surprise right there. Yeah, Tony Todd. Leon. Everybody knows, of course, Leon Lett lives in Dallas Cowboys infamy. Um, he's got some, he had some problems in the playoffs way back in the day. Oh, yeah. Line yeah. Um, But this episode is a very good and very popular and very famous episode. This is the first time we see the Klingon homeworld. Um, mm -hmm. That's why was it Michael Piller gave big kudos to the uh, production design and art department for really creating this. He gave big kudos to Marv Rush, Marvin Rush, for, you know, really getting this lighting and these angles right and uh, really kind of creating the Klingon homeworld and making it iconic. What did you think overall, Sirach, of like the look and the feel and the shots and all that? Because there was a lot to bite into. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I picked up a lot of that too, you know, from the from certain moments, for example, when Worf comes into his brother's quarters, um, he asks him, is your quarters just this comfortable <laughs> or something to that effect, right? Yeah. Uh, like you little softy, you know, um, the way he was. But in that moment, in that scene, he didn't have the lights on in his quarters, the brother. And so the, the lighting was really dark in his quarters. And he kind of sat down into a nice soft lighting that accentuated his 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 outfit and put uh, the, also the softness of his skin tone. So we were able to actually see his face. But mm. there were moments in that shot where he was completely it was so dark you could barely see his his face as he was walking around until he sat down into the light. So that immediately let me know okay they're setting a, um, a lighting trend. Yes. For this character, right? There's a level of darkness and ominous mood that comes in for this particular character, which I thought was a nice uh, touch for uh, the brother. What was the brother's name? Kern. <clears throat> Kern, yeah. 
Yeah. If you'll recall, Kern came back later in Deep Space Nine when he asked his brother Worf to kill him. And yeah. there was that big discussion about, you know, Worf saying, this is our custom. I should be allowed to kill my brother, you know, like Jack Kevorkian style, but with a mechleth or something, some kind of Klingon knife. And Cisco mm -hmm. was like, that may be your custom, but mm -hmm. it is not our custom, which really created a very interesting discussion and thought process of, well, if a Klingon's custom is is this but they're in federation space or they're on a federation space station or he's a federation starfleet officer does do his customs override the customs of where he resides or where he works so that was really interesting but anyway that was the same character that was kern a few mm -hmm. years later and interestingly enough, that same debate was brought up in this episode as well. There were moments yep. there, for example, where Picard towards the end says, I will not allow an officer of my ship to be, um, you know, killed because of this rule. So he, all of a sudden, the umbrella changed. He went from, OK, I'm cool with the customs. I will play along. I'm his sidekick to, all right, no, I'm the captain of the Enterprise and now we're I'm putting a different hat on, and this hat is saying you can't kill this guy. So I thought that was um, they, they brought up this yeah. going back and forth between respecting somebody's customs and also Federation supersedes my uh, my duty as a Federation officer supersedes whatever this custom is about to do. And that is interesting. You're right because that is a different situation in that if they were on a federation ship we could say okay that's the same as deep space nine where he says not on my ship not on my watch mm -hmm. but picard is out there amongst billions <laughs> yeah. of people that could beat him up <laughs> and, yeah and already don't like him or don't trust him and he's going like nope and they're like who the f are you what do you mean nope <laughs> nope i'm nope not on my watch they're like get this clown out of here <laughs> but that was yeah, a pretty ballsy yeah. move by the way the f around and find out i can say it now fuck around and find out didn't want to say it in the <laughs> opening was one of the greatest lines ever written in star trek and let's see if i can find it yes the uh dura says Keep your place, Picard. Picard says, this is my place. Very good. Mm -hmm. uh, Dura good says, word. you do not command here. And Picard says, I'm not here to command. And Duras then says, then you must be ready to fight. Something Starfleet does not teach you. And Picard drops his whatever on the table, basically, and says, yeah. you may test that assumption at your convenience. And I'm like, that's the very yeah. first Fafo, right? <laughs> F -A -F -O. Yeah. <laughs> you may test that assumption at your convenience. And everybody's like, wow, Picard, I didn't know you had it in you. But uh, that was yeah. a very fun line. Great line. Yeah, um, that was a fun line. Um, I also, I'll also mention a lot of the times where I feel the writers do picard justice as a character and mm -hmm. uh, paint paint a picture of him that seems admirable or um honorable or um you know when he stands up for his crew or he stands up for a friend i think that's that makes him look good and that was lacking in the first two seasons right yes yes mm -hmm. and it, so so he had in he looked arrogant in moments in the first two seasons he looked like he had this entitlement or this kind of privilege that he was wielding mm -hmm. around as opposed to yeah it was more like he was their adversary rather than he was defending them or taking their side against a foreign yes. adversary yes yes and when you paint him in that light when he stands up for somebody like Worf and says um uh, you know, I'll be at your side, you know, um, you'll need the captain at your side. Those yeah. kinds of moments when he says, I'll be here for you. I'll stand um, by your side during trial. Um, your Chadish, whatever they call that, you know, and he says, you know, accepts that role. 
um, those things paint Picard in a good light and make him look like somebody who you would want to emulate. It makes him look like somebody who puts other people first or willing to sacrifice himself for um, a, a partner, a friend, uh, you know, Riker, in this case, War. Well, he's willing to stick his neck out. And and we just saw this, I think, in the last episode where we were talking with Rene Echeverria about um, some of the things that he, you know, Picard was willing to do as far as getting court-martialed. Like he was willing to get, uh, suffer the whatever the penalty the admiral was going to levy upon him when he told Data to not follow the orders. Mm-hmm. Uh, you remember that yeah, moment? It was an excellent scene. Yeah, so he stood up for Data in that moment, right? Uh, and he was like, no, I'm not going to let you give over your daughter or your child to Starfleet um, command for observation or whatnot. Um, he overrode that order, put his neck on the line, showed us something that's honorable and respectable about Picard's character. And that's clever writing for me as a viewer. I, I can then root for Picard. I can then say, oh, okay, I like that guy. He's a good leader. He's willing to He's willing to suffer the slings and arrow for his fellow man. He's willing to risk his own career for um, a cause that is what he believes to be a righteous cause, like in that case, Data's right to be a parent. Um, and in this case, this was for Worf's honor, integrity, and for his father, um, his father's kind of namesake. So again, he's standing up and putting up himself on the line and willing to even risk, I guess, his life in this particular episode because he was yeah. threatened physically. So that shows me good character on Picard. That's good writing, and that's how you should write your captain. Your captain should be written in a way where the sympathy and compassion for his crew and his team, he puts on the line and he's willing to make that sac- that sacrifice. Yeah. And just to take uh, those compliments a couple steps further as well, it, it's it's one thing to be able to, you know, conceptualize this and say, let's put uh, Picard on the on the right side of whatever the battle is rather than him being the adversary. You know, he's doing these honorable things. But what really makes it work and, and makes it believable is is great dialogue. And they're writing great dialogue. You know, they're, that, that's what makes it believable. Otherwise, it's it's a great attempt, but that's, mm-hmm. you know, but they really see it through with, with excellent dialogue and, and believable dialogue. And then, of course, a lot of it is that it is Patrick Stewart, too. He, you could tell he's given lines that he's more comfortable with now. He delivers these... I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say in a more believable way, but when I'm watching him deliver these lines today, for example, they seem to fit and to flow and to be more natural with him and who he is than the ones in the first season. The first season being super rigid, okay, he's playing it off, he's working it, he's acting it, that's cool, that's great, but these seem to really be be natural fits for him. I feel like this is a very, they're they're comfortable lines that he can do a lot with. And so just big, big, uh, big kudos, lots of flowers to the writers for that. I thought that was very well done. Uh, And they're they're doing a a lot this third season. And one other thing that needs to be kind of highlighted is these guest stars in this episode were fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Tony Todd comes on right away as Kern, and he you can feel his ominous presence right away. He's mm-hmm. like, I'm in control. I'm in charge. Um, I'm the number one. Even even there were looks like Rikers, like, uh, I'll sit over <laughs> here in the, uh, in the Troy seat, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> in the submissive seat. Talk yeah, about my he feelings. Had look, he had that look where it was like, uh, I see who the boss is around here. And even when he approached him in that elevator scene or in that in that, you know, in that scene, he kind of was like, hey, can I offer you a suggestion? And I thought, again, Tony Todd was magnificent because you could just feel the tension there. You could feel his disapproval. Um, and that whole line he gives was the best line. I was one of the, my, my favorite lines when he says. Uh, 
man, I, he says, if I was offended, I would have killed you for offering a suggestion or something yeah. like that. That was, you know, uh, just to and and to add to that as well, what I like about Tony Todd and this group of actors that joined in for this episode is, I have a natural tendency as a you know, as like a big nerd and, and uh, you know, I, I definitely, I have my moments where I nitpick things. I can't help it. I'm a nitpicker. I'm like, Hey, this guy, whatever. <laughs> my first thought oftentimes is something to the effect of, nah, this guy's not really acting like a, a, a Klingon or that's not how Klingons act. And I remember it's a planet. It's an empire. They act differently. I don't act the same as somebody from Alabama, probably. <laughs> Uh, lucky for them but so so then i realized wow what they're actually doing is they're expanding our view and our knowledge of klingons and then i start to realize how much i enjoy their interpretation as actors of klingons that they're not doing an impression of a previous klingon they're not doing an impression of Worf. they're not doing an impression of general war from whatever it was star trek six or i don't remember uh, they're not doing these impressions or General Kang, Chang, uh, or Koloth or Kor or any. Anyway, mm -hmm. the point is they're creating their own character. They're creating their own Klingon, their own version of it. And I think it's great. And these guys all did a great job, including the old lady that had like four lines, and <laughs> nothing more. But even she really brought it, you know. I thought she was a great guest star as well. Um, that whole line where she just keeps repeating, I am dead to Picard, you know, I'm dead. You know, you can feel that, that she lost a part of herself in that accident, you know, and that she's never been the same. And, you know, she's tried to bury that side of her life. There was a lot of undertone there in her performance. I thought she was great as a K-list was her character name. Um, even she had that one line where she says, you're still fat. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like she she was great uh for her guest star my also one of my favorites was the one who played this Klingon high council the kim peck actor mm -hmm. i thought i thought the scene where he takes warp to the side and just basically says hey man just you know let it go and you know, no nobody will look, to, you know, disrespect you or look down on you if you don't show up tomorrow or something like that. There was a genuine um, connection there. I felt there was a real, I felt real sympathy, a real. He was really talking to him in a heart to heart kind of way. I felt, and it seemed authentic. And I loved the performance that the actor gave in that particular uh, kind of heart to heart moment that he gave with war i thought it was great yeah his name is charles cooper and uh he was also in star trek 5 the final frontier he played cord two r's in that name cord so uh he's definitely an older actor man he was born in 1926 uh in san francisco you know, a very accomplished actor uh, there. So yeah. now back to this episode here. This was, there There were a lot of really heavy, heavy implications here where they're saying, I mean, the main thing is, Worf, you are the fall guy for to keep the Empire together. Um, now we don't know that right away. Actually, before we get to that, do you think, because I thought of this at the very end, do you think that maybe we could have cut out some of the beginning of Kern pretending not to know Worf and all this stuff and expanding the Klingon planet stuff? Because at the end, I realized we didn't really need those extra few scenes of Kern messing with people. Like I thought he was going to come on because I vaguely remembered it. He was going to come on. And at the very first commercial, you know, the, 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 the teaser thing, he was going to come on and then he was going to say, you know, your new commander. And then Mr. Wolf, is everything all right? Do you know him, Mr. Wolf? That is my brother Kern. And then commercial or, or Kern would say it or something. 
And then we jump over, but they did all this extra stuff. I guess it works. It was cool. It was fine. But I just couldn't help but wonder if we could have had more, use these sets more and use these actors more and just kind of immerse ourselves more into the Klingon homeworld. Um, yes. Yes. But I guess, you know, you know, I would say they were trying to take us and throw us for a loop and have mm -hmm. us like, you know, the, the, the goal was, you know, you think it's going this way and then boom, it, it, it makes this right turn. And I guess they did accomplish that because when he first comes on, um, I didn't know he was just the brother. Right. So that's one, you know, loop they throw us for. And then you don't know that he's the brother and he's also there for, to tell warp about you know the father being accused as a traitor so um that's good writing for me because i i, mm -hmm. I don't want to know where the story is going I, I like that it's they also piggybacked on the fact that we had previously seen Riker uh on the klingon ship a few episodes or last season i think you know where he was on board that klingon ship and had to take control and command of that ship when it was necessary so um that's also a good callback writing wise like hey rem remember that episode we watched um this is the reverse of that instead of Riker being the exchange student you know person it's now we're returning the favor and, and taking in uh Klingon exchange student um but it but it did seem uh what did seem unusual to me, and I'm sure this would have seemed unusual as well in the episode that we saw with Riker, was you're going to let some Klingon exchange student be the number one in command? Like, <laughs> he's like, I can understand being like somewhere like the number three or lower. Well, he was number, number, he was number two, just like Riker was on their ship. Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that I mean, was that's pretty like, hefty. So yeah. he's the number one, right? Yeah. Riker's exactly. the number one, essentially, after the captain. Yeah, you're right. So yeah. he's he's basically put into the number one role, which to me is a little bit too much. Like just handing over your your stealth jet over to you know your adversary, or you know I don't know yeah. about that. I think it's a little bit too much power to give to an exchange student. But um, for the sake of the story, I guess it made a little it made some sense because it did show. He was running a really ship, a tight ship. You see, Wesley was sitting up straight, like he didn't want to even arch his back around. The yeah, curve. did you see how he, he called out West, but not Data? They were both snickerdoodling yeah. together. They're both like, "Tee hee, look at the Klingon. His boots are stinky, aren't they?" Oh, and then they pull away, and he's like, "Wesley," and Data's like, "Oh, I'm just sitting here scanning for life forms, making a life form song. No big deal. Doing my own thing. Sorry, Wes." And Wesley's like, "I'm just sitting up straight." I'm not doing anything bad. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it was funny. Um, and then I didn't even get the whole um, asteroid back and forth between Kern and Warp, where he's like, "So then, there we didn't need to avoid the asteroids, did we?" It was like, <laughs> and then Warp gets all mad, like, "Hmm, like, I, come on, I didn't get that little exchange." Uh, to me, there would be more blunt and direct as Klingons if there was some beef between them. They would just say, why are you pressing the buttons like that? You fucking, you know, <laughs> are you soft? <laughs> Something direct. Yeah. Well, hey, let's I guess we didn't more. have to avoid the asteroids. It was a very like, come on, like, it was a uh, yeah. soft comeback for a Klingon. <laughs> it, for a Klingon, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about that more for sure. Uh, let's jump into our break. Because I want to make fun of Wes, too. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kind of. Uh, we'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. <laughs> 